My name is Justin Cottle, and this is The Dissection Room. Human anatomy is the single most useful scientific discipline that anyone can ever learn. Now, that's a lofty statement to claim that it's more useful than physics, chemistry, or any other discipline. And to be honest, though, anatomy is really a subdiscipline of biology, but for this conversation, we're going to go ahead and just refer to it as a discipline. Now, there's two primary reasons that this is the case. And the first one, is what separates it from physics and chemistry and other scientific dis disciplines, and that's its immediate relevancy to us as people. You're learning about yourself. I, I, I often say it's mind-blowing to me how people know more about cars, computers, and even the lives of celebrities than they do their own body. Like right now, if I asked you to trace the location of your pancreas, could you do it? Now, obviously, there's depth to the body, that you're not going to be able to accurately point to it, but could you actually trace it out roughly? Do you know what the pancreas does? Do you know how it does it? Do you know what controls the pancreas? Does the pancreas control itself or is something else in charge of it? And if something else is in charge of it, how do the two communicate? And we can just keep on going with this. Now, obviously, this... This is usually just left for those in the medical field. But this body is the one thing you carry around with yourself 24-7, 365 days a year for the, your, the entirety of your life. If by, by pushing accountability off to just those in the medical field, I personally believe you're doing yourself a massive disjustice. The fact is, the more anatomy you know, the better lifestyle choices you're going to make. Now, you're not going to be perfect. I'm far from perfect, trust me. But the difference is, I can, I can no longer justify those poor lifestyle choices. And you see this all throughout the healthcare and medical field. Healthcare professionals of all types start making better lifestyle choices based on what they see in their jobs. So that's what separates it from the other sciences. But the second reason it's so useful really comes down to the natural consequences of just learning it. And this is not, say, you know, making better lifestyle choices. This is literally just how the science is built and framed helps you understand how other things are built and framed. What I'm talking about is systems thinking. Systems thinking is an approach to solving problems that exists within systems theory. And systems theory is, is everywhere, right? This is not unique to human anatomy. You find systems theory in physics, chemistry, literally any scientific discipline you can name, you will find systems theory integrated into it. But what makes it different is that by just learning your anatomy, trying to make better health and lifestyle choices, you're going to start understanding how systems are built. Because that's what systems theory is. It's just understanding that, oh, hey, things are made of systems and subsystems. And yes, we can reduce them. We can, we can look at individual parts and components and we can ask ourselves, what does this thing do? But at some point, you're going to have to say, well, that's not going to be very helpful. We're, what we really need to know is what will happen to the entire system. So if we went back to our pancreas example, knowing what the pancreas does is nice. Knowing what controls it is also nice. But what we're really wanting to know is, what effect does the pancreas have on the entire body? What effect would pancreatic cancer have on the entire body? That's what we're really concerned with. Because when we get to that really granular level, it's more of an intellectual endeavor. And that may be great for you. You know, it is for me. I love just nerding out on those types of things. But if we're talking about making this practical, we need to ask ourselves, how is this going to affect the entire system? Or how is it at least going to affect that subsystem? And then how would that affect the entire system? All of that belongs underneath systems theory. And systems thinking is how you approach those types of problems. 
Now, the way that I've been introducing systems theory to my students for the past 10 years is with what's known as the hierarchy of life. The hierarchy of life is a stratification of life. So strata meaning layer. And what you're saying is there are going to be different subsystems that will all accumulate into one global system. So this begins at the molecular level. So molecules being, at least in this context, going to be proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. Now, those are the macromolecules. You also have micromolecules, you know, we're talking about vitamins and minerals, but for our purposes right now, let's just focus on those three. If you put those together in a functional way, you get what's called a cell. And a cell in itself is a, is a system. But this cell has a function. It has a job that it's going to do. And we can name a whole lot of cells, right? We can say like neurons, muscle cells. We can even differentiate different types of muscle cells. Maybe you're a cardiomyocyte. Maybe you're a striated skeletal muscle cell. But cells are molecules that are just working together to achieve a goal. And that is a cellular goal. But we can then take those cells and we can put them together and they can start working together to also achieve a goal, a larger goal. But when we do that, we now have to redefine, reclassify what we're looking at. We're now looking at a tissue. So if I have a group of epithelial cells and I have them all working together and creating a sheet, I now have epithelial tissue. And then what we can do is take different types of tissue and wrap them together. And when we wrap them together, again, to achieve a common goal or maybe multiple goals, it depends on what you're really building. But when you put multiple tissues together, you get what's called an organ. So for instance, the lungs are an organ. The goal of the lungs is essentially to bring oxygen into the bloodstream and to remove carbon dioxide from the bloodstream and then out the body eventually, but the lungs don't remove it from the body. They just remove it from the bloodstream. And technically, and this is where it's kind of interesting, because we could probably actually <laughs> debate that a little bit, because you could even say, well, that's really the goal of the alveoli and the blood vessels around it. What are we really classifying as lungs? Because the lungs are just the connective tissue that surrounds it. And so you can start seeing how we can already kind of muddy the waters a bit. But my point here is organs are just groups of functional tissues working together for a goal. But then we can put organs together to achieve an even greater goal. And if we do that, we get what's called an organ system. So you could have the respiratory system. The respiratory system includes the lungs, but also the bronchial tree, the trachea, the larynx, the pharynx, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, all of those belong to the respiratory system. And together they work to bring oxygen in, carbon dioxide out, as well as do the thing I'm doing right now, and that is speak. But then what we can do is take multiple organ systems and put them together to solve the problems that are going to arise by simply living and operating in nature. Because breathing is only one thing you have to do. You have to also get nutrients into your system. You have to excrete waste. So then all of a sudden you get different organ systems. So muscular system, skeletal system, digestive system, endocrine system. You put all those together, you arrive at what we call an organism. Now, when I'm teaching in the classroom, the hierarchy of life is day one. I find it beneficial to the students to explain that in reality, things are a lot bigger and a lot smaller and just overall more complex than I'm about to make it. Because from there, that's when we get into the anatomy of things. And anatomy is inherently reductionist. Anatomy itself is not systems thinking. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of systems thinking because systems thinking is about looking at things globally where anatomy is a science of classification. And to classify things, you gotta take it out. You gotta, you're basically 
looking at its size, you know, its color, you're you're observing it, you're describing it, you're naming parts of it. That is the opposite of systems thinking. It's it's purely reductionist. But again, the point I'm making here is that by learning those parts, you're going to have to start assembling them together. Because only basic anatomy is like that. When you start getting to say, or even I should say, not even basic anatomy, but only certain systems are like that. So for instance, if you want, if you're learning the endocrine system, you're going to see that an endocrine system and the nervous system are control systems. That means they are going to have an effect on every other system. And that's a very complex thing. Now they use different methods of control. So nervous system is going to use electrochem electrochemistry while endocrine system is going to use hormones. And hormones can be proteins, they can be fats, they can be carbs. But you're going to have different methods of control, but they're still going to interact with all these other systems. And you're starting to get an idea as to the interconnectedness of the body. And I'm always trying to impress upon my students, there's no most important system. There's no most important organ. That's one of the most commonly asked questions I've ever had over my career, especially as I've moved into social media, is what's the most important organ? I think everyone wants to hear the brain or the heart. And there's probably a good argument for those being the most important. Because, for instance, I could remove a kidney, one kidney, and you'd be okay. Maybe not okay, but, I mean, you're going to survive. The other kidney can adapt. But my method of removal, I don't want to get too into the weeds with it, but I could take a leg. All right? There's certain things I can take that is not going to mean the failure of the organism. But at the same time, there are real consequences for that. And this is where systems thinking really comes in. This is what healthcare practitioners are really trying to engage with. Is they're asking, what happens if one of those components, one of those variables is affected? Maybe it's disease, maybe it's injury, maybe it's age. When you start looking at the anatomy beyond the components and instead as the subsystems and systems they are, and how they are going to interact with one another for the organism, that is where anatomy becomes an extremely powerful science. So let's now move away from the conceptual and start getting practical. How can systems thinking learned through anatomical studies benefit me in my day-to-day -day life? And the first thing you're gonna need to do is just be able to identify and isolate individual systems. The problem that a lot of people have, and I say this based on my own past experience, is that you're trying to solve a problem by just looking at an individual component without understanding how it interacts and is interconnected with other systems or other components. Right, you're trying to say like you're trying to break down like the behavior of a loved one or friend. Well, if you're really trying, if you if your goal is to really understand the problem, if you're just trying to pick them apart individually, you're never going to get anywhere. It might make you feel better. You might you might be like, oh, this is great. I'm so excited. I'm so glad that I could just rip them apart in my head. But if again, if your goal is to actually understand their motivations, you're going to have to start to expand the radius, and look and try to isolate a system that they are operating within. So in anatomy, if I'm te when I, I teach about the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the nervous system, I don't just start randomly talking about different things. Can you imagine that anatomy class? If it's just like, all right, today we're talking about the liver. Tomorrow we're talking about digit four on your left foot. The day after that, we're going to talk about the nasal septum. Right, there's got to be a sequence. Pattern recognition, as we will see, is very important within systems thinking. So the first thing you're going to want to do is just be able to isolate a system. And that may be difficult at first. This is where practice is going to be very helpful. And just the more you do this, the easier it's going to become. But once you've identified and isolated some kind of system, it doesn't have to be a large system either. Remember, it could be just a subsystem. 
This is where you're going to reduce the parts as much as you can. Now, this is why I believe anatomy is so useful. Now, granted, many sciences are inherently reductionist. It's not just anatomy. Again, systems thinking is important and vital to all aspects of STEM, right? Your science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This is, this is what they are. They are systems thinking. But you need to be able to understand the parts if you're going to start to be able to ask what happens when something goes wrong with the parts. Right? Like most people become inquisitive about their body once something goes wrong. It's when you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes that you start investigating the pancreas. You may not have ever thought of the pancreas before that moment, but now all of a sudden it's relevant to you and it's important to your health. Come on, I, it's about time you learn something about the pancreas. But something happens once you learn about the part. So you've identified a part, a component, and you did that based on a need to understand a system and what that system is, what are the consequences of diabetes on my body, right? So that's the system. So what you want to do is whatever your problem is, whether it's interpersonal, interwork, right? doesn't matter what, uh, what you're trying to solve here. What you're trying to do and what you need to do is isolate and identify the system to begin with. And then you're going to break it apart as best you can into its components. But you have to understand there's, there's always a layer to this or multiple layers, I should say. Right? So whenever I'm teaching basic anatomy and I'm talking about, say, the cardiovascular system, well, the cardiovascular system is like, what is, what is the cardiovascular system? Well, it's the heart, it's the blood vessels, and it's lymphatics, essentially. That's, that's basically your cardiovascular system. But if we want to then break that down, it's like, okay, well, there's different types of blood vessels. Blood can look differently in different aspects. So we can actually break down each of these components but at first, you want to say, this is the basics. Here's your heart. Here's your blood vessels. Here's your lymph, right? This is what, that's how you're going to approach it at very first. So you don't have to overwhelm yourself, but you do need to understand which components you're dealing with. So once you've identified the system and you've broken it down into its basic components, the next question is to start asking, how are those different components interconnected? Again, maybe a few components, maybe a lot of components. It really just depends on the problem you're attempting to tackle. And once you start looking at these interconnections, that can, that can be represented in multiple ways. You know, but my goal has always been to simplify this as much as possible at first. I want the, the, the anatomy 101 level. I want the interconnectedness 101 level. Let's just give it to me straight. Let's figure out what are the basic components and what are those basic interconnections interactions and interconnectedness because once you kind of approach what simplifying is so important in the initial stages again so you don't become overwhelmed and this could be casual say like you're trying to identify an issue you may be having an interpersonal relationship issue with say a friend they're doing something you don't understand well what you can do is isolate the system them as a component and then start asking yourself, well, how are they interconnected to other things? How are these other things influencing them? Because the, that, what that'll do is then lead into the next thing. In systems thinking, loops and feedback systems are very important. So feedback systems come in two flavors. You have a negative feedback and a positive feedback system. A negative feedback system Again, this is why I think anatomy is so useful, is I like to always teach people about the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, just the endocrine system in general. The endocrine system is your hormonal system. Hormones, again, can be proteins, fats, uh, carbohydrates, and basically they're signaling molecules that float around in your bloodstream. And what will happen is they will bind to a, um, they'll bind to a site that will cause an action at a cell. It'll cause something to occur. But you have to ask yourself, how does your body know how many hormones to have flowing through your bloodstream at any one point in time? It uses feedback systems. Inside of your brain, you have a structure called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus 
has blood vessels running through it. And what will happen is it will analyze the hormonal concentrations in the bloodstream, but it's also receiving a wide variety of information from other aspects of the body. And so based on a whole complex set of interactions, it may need to elevate one hormone or decrease the concentration of one hormone. And so it will then modulate that. And it does that through feedback systems. So a negative feedback system is where you have a hormone and it's starting to increase and it reaches a point and that tells it to stop. You've reached the point, now stop. The easiest example, the classic example is a thermostat. You set it to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, when it gets to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, that's where you want it to stop. If you didn't, that's, a, that's not a good thermostat. You have a problem. So that's exactly what a negative feedback system is there to do. Once you reach that point, let's stop. A positive feedback system, on the other hand, ramps it up. In the body, an easy example of this is oxytocin during birth. Oxytocin is a hormone that will actually modulate contractions of the uterus during birth. And what will happen is oxytocin levels will start really low. Contractions will be minutes apart. You know, sometimes they can even be days apart in those early stages when you're in those pre-labor stages. But as the oxytocin is being secreted, it's going to reach a certain level. And once it reaches that level, it's actually going to ramp up production instead of stopping. And as it does that, now more oxytocin is being secreted and contractions are actually going to get closer together. And once they get to about five minutes apart, that's where you really want to get to the hospital. And then eventually, when the baby is actually being birthed, we're talking like we're exiting the birth canal. I mean, there's so much oxytocin flowing through the bloodstream. The, the uterus is just <laughs> contracting so much. But you see how that is a positive feedback loop. Feedback loops are essential within systems. There's always going to be influences. Some influences will get someone to stop an activity or something to stop. Other influences will cause that to increase. You know, I'm a, I'm a parent of a, um, a toddler as well as um, the next stage. I forget right now what the next stage is after a toddler with a young child. So I have a five-year-old and I have a one-year-old. You know, the worst time to try and correct a behavior when there's a tantrum, even in the five-year-old, especially in the one-year-old, is during the tantrum, right? You're not going to be able to reason with them, right? They're in the middle of a positive feedback loop. And I don't want to try and fix any problem because it's just not going to get fixed and anything I do is going to make it worse. In fact, let's say there's agitation. Say my five-year-old, something, something has frustrated them. If I all of a sudden just start saying, hey, why are you being frustrated? Since you're frustrated, I'm going to take away this or I respond in some kind of um, less than uh, diplomatic way that can fuel the fire. And now my five-year-old is even more amped up and the response is going to be more exaggerated. We're in a positive feedback loop. When you're looking, say, like if we're to go back to that example with your friend and you're trying to identify what is going on here, you can ask yourself what kind of loops, what kind of feedback systems might be at play here. Is me hounding them? Is me investigating them to begin with a problem? Right? Would, <laughs> is me talking to them about their issues a problem? Or would that be more of a negative feedback system? Could I actually get it? What, maybe it's more so that I haven't spoken with them. Do you see how you can start picking this apart? You can do this with pretty much anything. As long as it's a part of a system, which, well, surprise, surprise, everything is a part of a system. The next thing you want to do is start considering different perspectives. Now, an easy example, but one of my favorite examples to give in the human body has to do with pain. If I burn my fingers, you can say that my fingers hurt, right? I could say that. That's a perfectly acceptable thing to say. But we have to ask ourselves, where is that pain? Because the nerve endings don't process pain. All they do is send a signal. 
The signal travels up my finger, up my arm, through my peripheral nervous system, up to my central nervous system, and it goes to a variety of different locations inside of my brain, and then it becomes processed, and I say, ouch. I say, I don't like that. Is pain in the fingers, or is it in the mind? We can definitely say damage has happened to the fingers. And where this gets interesting is when you start asking yourself about amputees. Because amputees will experience a phenomenon known as phantom pain. Let's say that an amputee has lost their arm below the elbow. Well, they can still feel pain in their fingers from time to time. Or different sensations. It's not even always just pain. Maybe they feel itchy. Maybe they feel tingly. Now we can, we can say for a fact that there is no issue with the, ner- with the nerve endings there because the nerve endings are gone. But that's because the real estate is still, the real estate that is that's devoted to processing that information is still in the brain. It's still there. So what that means is that it's, it's susceptible to misfirings or just not even necessarily misfirings, just strange firings. My point here is we have to really ask ourselves about perspectives within these systems and these individual components. So if I was, if we were to go back to that, you know, example of our friend with the issue, I mean, we can look at it like, is the issue with me? Or what, how, what role am I playing in this? What role is my friend playing in this? What, what roles are other people playing in this situation? But not even just people, what other things? But if we move away from, say, this interpersonal relationship type thing, we can also start asking ourselves about greater questions. So for right now, I'm completely obsessed with artificial intelligence. And this is something I want to talk and discuss at length on this podcast, is how artificial intelligence is going to affect us. But if we start looking at this from different perspectives, because we can say, right, if we go back to kind of our methodology here, we can say artificial intelligence is the component. We can start asking ourselves, how is artificial intelligence interconnected throughout society with different jobs, different people? And we can see that artificial intelligence affects different people in different ways. We can say they have feedback systems. We can see the negative and the positive feedback system. But like all we have to do is look at creatives, specifically artists and writers, because those are the ones that most people are familiar with, at least at the point of this recording, as being primarily affected by generative AI. To an artist, generative AI may possibly be the worst thing to ever occur to them, professionally. But to others, those that really don't have any artistic talent, or at least they haven't worked to develop that artistic talent, but they are, they've been able through the use of generative AI to find utility in art generation, for them it's more of a collaborator. So on one side it's more destructive and on the other side it's more positive. Obviously this is true for all systems. You just have to look for it. This is why it's just so important that once you've identified those components, you've found the feedback loops, you start asking yourself, What is the value in it for me, them, others? What are the other perspectives involved with this? The next thing you wanna do is start recognizing the system's behaviors over time. This essentially is just asking yourself, is this issue, this problem I'm attempting to solve, something that can resolve on its own? Is it temporary or is this going to require intervention? Also, if I do intervene, what are the repercussions of it? If I don't intervene and it does resolve, what are the repercussions of it, right? You're starting to interpret behaviors, right? And you can only really ask yourself this question once you understand the interconnectedness of that system. So something, again, that's hyper relevant for me is parenting. So I think about the, in sense, say I have a five-year-old again, right? How much do I really need to intervene? Well, I mean, obviously that's going to depend on what is happening. Some things I may need to intervene every single time but most other things, probably not. I gotta ask myself, you know, what other, again, taking different perspectives into account, what, um, could this problem be solved at school? Could this problem, and should this problem be solved through just play with other children? Will this problem simply be solved 
through aging. I mean, you have to understand the prefrontal cortex does not come pre-wired in the same degree of complexity as an adult. To expect a five-year-old to respond in the way of a 25, 30, 40, 50 year old, that in, is in itself irrational. You could talk with a five year old on some issues for hours. You could explain it a thousand different ways. You could use the most beautiful metaphors that have ever existed and it'll all go over their head. And instead, you wait one year and when they turn six, the neurons have connected in such a way that all of a sudden they understand it. Now, now they can cognitively get it. This is about behaviors. What you're doing is you're observing the system. You, again, you identify it, everything we've already talked about, but you observe that system and you ask yourself, how is it behaving over time? How much do I need to intervene? Do I need to intervene? And what are the repercussions and consequences of intervening or not? So the next thing you want to do is create diagrams and models. Now, this sounds like too much. And I'm not telling you that you need to literally build a diagram and a model for every single problem. And for me, I've always kind of just considered this as writing something down. At the same time, for complex issues, I definitely will make this more formalized. And let me give you an example that's based around anatomy. When I'm teaching the cardiovascular system, specifically the heart, I often have a thought exercise with my students where I have us all pretend as though we are able to reside or ride on an individual red blood cell. And the question I ask them is, where do we go as we travel through the heart? And what I'll do is I'll turn to the whiteboard and I'll create a flow chart or an anatomy we would call, we would call this a trace. And it starts with three boxes. The first box, superior vena cava, then there's inferior vena cava, and then there's the coronary sinus. And for our purposes, you don't need to know any of those structures. But then what'll happen is I'll have arrows coming from those three boxes and all merging to one box that says right atrium. Then it flows through the tricuspid valve and then into the right ventricle. And then this is going to continue on. I think you understand my point here. Traces are extraordinarily useful inside of anatomy. What they're doing is describing a sequence of events. And if you're trying to isolate a problem, or rather solve a problem that you have isolated, understanding the sequence of events is extraordinarily useful. But here's the thing. It has its limits. And there's a quote that I've been thinking about daily. Now, uh, for uh, the past couple weeks. And that's a quote. So it's, it's a famous quote from the author E.M. Forster. He lived in the early to mid-1900s. And the quote goes like this. The king died, and then the queen died, is a story. The king died, and therefore the queen died of grief, is a plot. And what he's saying there is that a story is really just a sequence of events. It's important. You need to have those sequence of events. But the plot, that's about causality. This happened, therefore that happened. This happened, but then this happened. Those are essential parts of storytelling. And if you really think about it, they're essential to understanding problems, because that's what it really is. At the end of the day, what we're talking about, whether you're writing a novel, a blog, or if you're just trying to solve this issue at work, this is a story. You're in the midst of a story. If you were to try and communicate this very thing to someone else, say you go home, you see your spouse, and you're going to talk with them about all the madness that's happening, you're telling them a story. But no one wants the story that's just the sequence of events. That's boring, right? No one wants that story. Well, I went into work. I walked through the door. I turned left, saw my desk. Right? No one wants that story. You want the plot. You want the, you want the meaty details of things. You want the causality of it. The same goes for solving problems. 
So that's what you want to do. You want to, and it can be rather, useful to use those diagrams. So it could be that if you have a problem, you could create a flow chart. Maybe it's a simple flow chart. Maybe there's three things, but what you're trying to say is, look, I understand the components. I understand how interconnected everything is. I understand the feedback systems. I understand all of that. What I really want to figure out now is what led to this? And where does it go from here? Because this, at this point, that's when you can start asking yourself, what happens if something switches? What happens if something changes? What if I switch these two things around, right? I, I actually translocate some of these things. And then you can see how that works within your model, within your diagram. Now, I, I, look, this can be overdoing it at times. I, again, I'm not claiming for every one of your problems to approach it this way. But what I've found that can be helpful with even minor problems is just writing them down sometimes or talking about them out loud. Just, I can't tell you how many times I'll go on a walk and I, and, and I just have my headphones in and I am just talking to myself, right? To, to people, I have, the reason I have my headphones is, is so that <laughs> I don't look as though I'm just literally talking to myself. You know, I have, <laughs> I guess there's some self-consciousness there. But what I'm doing is I'm just talking things out loud. I'm trying to work my way through it. And what I'm trying to do is to determine the plot, the causality of things. It's easy to determine the sequence of events, but to find that causality, that is a very unique problem to solve. And flow charts, diagrams, models, just writing it down, talking it out, can be extremely useful in solving that problem. The next thing you wanna do is reflect on the process. Now this is such an important stage and it's something that I have done my entire life even well before I even knew what systems theory and systems thinking was. Um, it's just something that I think a lot of, or most if not all creative people do. But to me, creativity is really an expression of problem solving. I don't see it any real different or see it differently than just solving a problem. So even someone who may not consider themselves to be creative, if they are solving a problem, I would say that is creative. An artist just expresses that problem differently. But reflecting on a process is different than reflecting on a problem. Because there are plenty of times that you'll go through these processes. You identify the the problem, the interconnectedness, and everything that we've already talked about, and then it just doesn't work. Or you're stuck. And you're like, well, crap. That's that's not what I wanted. I actually wanted this. Th 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 this was this is supposed to solve the problem. And it, at, at that point, you want to reflect back. You want to figure out where things might have gone wrong. But again, you got to be very careful here because it's so easy to fall into the trap of rumination. Or instead you're just focusing on the problem over and over and over again, as opposed to the process that's going to provide a solution. So for me, you know, well, actually, before I say that, I should say like, you know, this isn't anatom or anatomy based purely or purely anatomy based, but you'll see this oftentimes with healthcare providers, right? A doctor say someone comes in with a set of signs and symptoms. And for those of you who may not know, say like if someone comes in with every single sign and symptom for influenza, there is a protocol to treat influenza. The doctor doesn't have to do much thinking. It's just, okay, here's this, 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 do this, and you should be better. The thinking doesn't really come into play until the treatment doesn't work. So then that's when they start reflecting back on everything. It's like, oh, what was the problem here? What did we do? See, they're reflecting on the process itself. They're not just like, is it influenza A? Is it influenza A? Is it influenza? That that does that's not going to help them. They're they're trapped. <laughs> they're trapped in their own feedback loop at this point. So that you see this all the time in medicine. But for me personally, this reflection process has been essential to my creative process. You know, early in the early days, um, um, making content for the Institute of Human Anatomy, we didn't have many viral successes on YouTube. Now, it's important to say here, I have never been the type to produce content with the goal of being viral. I don't think that's actually helpful to the overall channel. Like, it makes you feel good. Uh, trust me, 
The dopamine surge that comes from watching those numbers just increase is ridiculous. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, are these viewers valuable to me in the long run? Or are they only just solving a temporary problem? For me, I always hope it's going to go viral. But my goal is not virality. My goal is primarily to educate, to solve problems for people, to help. But that's hard to do sometimes. Sometimes you're just sitting there like, what do I do here? And I remember there was this one specific time, again, this is early on, I'm sitting in the lab, and I'm just looking around, looking at the ceiling for about two hours. That's not an exaggeration. And if someone was recording it, they would hear me just muttering from time to time, like, I wonder if, uh, maybe. And that's it for two hours. Now, by the way, this is a very common occurrence. This is just the one that sticks out of my mind because I think it's the first time it really happened creatively for me creating social media content. And all of a sudden, I, I remember I was looking at the skeleton and I just, it hit me. I'm like, ah, oh, a C-section. Do a video on a C-section. That was one of our very first early successes. But I remember, you know, this is, I wasn't reflecting on a problem. I wasn't constantly just like, come up with a video, come up with a video, come up with a video. Instead, it's, what are, I'm, I'm asking myself, what are the problems? What, and I'm looking for the interconnectedness of it, right? I'm starting to work my way through this systems type thinking logic to figure out how I can solve these problems. What are the solution sets? And for me, it made a lot of sense to speak to mothers, to speak to them about C-sections. My son was born through a C-section. So it's like there's relevancy to it there. But I think it's very important to note that, I mean, my creative process is reflecting on the process, not the problem. And that's work to me. And you see this with creatives all the time. I'm not unique or special. You see this with all sorts of creatives. I know this for a fact with other writers that it's work. Like how many writers will just talk about like, I'm stared out the window today for two, three hours. That whole time was work. On paper, it makes no sense. People look at that and they're like, that's not work, friend. (laughs) You're just staring out the window. But it is work. As long as you're reflecting on the process and not the problem. Remember, you don't want to ruminate. You want to innovate. Now, the last thing I want to talk about really isn't the last step in this process. If we were to say the last step, that's probably the reflection stage. The problem is that finding an exact spot for this last thing is difficult. And that's because it can happen anywhere throughout the entire process. And that is pattern recognition. But pattern recognition is complex. And the problem that we have as humans is that we evolved to be very good at recognizing and identifying patterns. Too good in many ways. Because we can find patterns in things that there really is no pattern to be found. And this is how we can get trapped in systems that may seem logical, but it's really garbage in, garbage out, right? If you are able to identify the fault, the, the, the faulty premise, that faulty pattern, then you can find yourself executing this systems thinking process perfectly. And it still hasn't done anything for you because you have been trapped in a false pattern or something you just really shouldn't be concerning yourself with. So that's why I want to actually devote an entire episode to this pattern recognition aspect of it. What the way I'm approaching this is though the other, the other steps in this process we've discussed that's systems thinking 101 or in this systems theory course of sorts, um, pattern recognition, this is systems theory or systems thinking 102. This is the more advanced stage. This is where, cause these have really interesting types, right? This is where you're getting into system archetypes. Right, so system archetypes, these are just different types of patterns that you can recognize. Right? A real easy example would be like the tragedy of the commons. So let's say a system's working a little bit too well for one population and it's coming at the cost of another. So let's say there's a shared resource and one population is able to use that resource for their own gain, but it comes at the detriment of the other. How do you navigate that? Right? These are, these are important. These are very, very important. But for, in my opinion, I think it's best to familiarize yourself 
with this process, with this line of thinking first, get accustomed to it, get acclimated to it, and then we can start moving towards that. This is the power of anatomy. You know, for me, a lot of this systems type thinking was very familiar, even when I was just starting to learn anatomy. And I imagine, as you've been listening to this, you're thinking the same thing. A lot of this, some of it seems to be common sense. But putting it in this framework is extremely useful. And for me, I think it was very powerful because I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but I was able to identify this process more or less very early on in my anatomy career and be able to start using that differently because what this systems thinking does is it lends to another really important form of thinking that I think not enough people know about and that is lateral thinking. Lateral thinking is something, again, we're gonna devote an entire episode and probably multiple episodes to it because this is one of the most important aspects of creation or creativity, innovation, and that is taking knowledge learned in one domain and applying it to another. Right? This is, this is where you, know, you see this all the time being talked about in business. It's saying, oh, well, you know, I have a problem but we don't know how to solve this problem. And then all of a sudden it comes from someone in the group that's like, hey, I have this idea. You know, I encountered a similar situation in this other field and they're somehow able to apply that and you have created a novel solution. That's the, that's the power of anatomy. And I was able to figure that out very early on. And so then when I stumbled upon systems thinking, it was almost validating of sorts because I was like, oh, not the sense that I'm again feeling all egotistical and high on myself as much as I was thinking, I'm on to something. This is working. There's something really of substance here. And it's helped tremendously over the years with big, massive problems, especially to help detach myself from it. But not even just problems. This has helped me tremendously in the creative process to figure out how do, where do you go from here? What do I do? How can I implement this? And that's why I really truly recommend everyone learn anatomy because again, you can learn systems thinking through any science, through any of the STEM subjects. You can learn systems thinking on your own. Many degree programs, you'll see this in MBA programs quite often, and you'll see this in science classes. Now, I don't, I mean, maybe there is, and I'm just not familiar with it. I'm not going to pretend to be familiar with all the different types of degree programs out there, but I don't believe there's a degree in systems thinking. I don't know how many courses are being offered at universities. Most often, systems thinking is a class, right? It's a single class, or it's more just kind of like baked in to the degree program itself into these courses, right? Just simply learning biology, being a biology major, you learn a lot of the systems thinking and systems theory, you know, it's just part of it. So you don't even have to do that. There's books out there. There's resources, which I'll put in the show notes that you can look to if you just are interested in learning this, the nuts and bolts of it without devoting yourself to anatomy. But the reason, again, that I believe anatomy is so powerful is because on top of this understanding around systems, you also learn about yourself. And learning about yourself, relevancy is so important, right? You, we all know this to be true. That if you can, if you can get, at least think about it from a marketing perspective, right? Marketing 101 is make it relevant to the consumer, right? Find their problem point. Where are they struggling? If you're able to make it relevant, well, what is the one thing we all have? We have a human body. So understanding how your body works and how these systems are all interacting, there's so much value there. Because at some point you are going to become unhealthy. Maybe it's through age, you know, maybe it's when you're 95 and it's just, that's how life works. But things will go wrong. And there's power in knowing what's going on, even if you don't really have any power of, or 
be able to influence it. For me personally, back in 2018, I nearly died. I had a small bowel obstruction. And I couldn't do anything about it. I'm not a surgeon. But I knew what the surgeons did. I knew what the problem meant. I understand deeply how close I came to dying. Does that help me in the recovery process? Not really. But do you know what did help me in the recovery process? Knowing why it's important to move as I, after an abdominal surgery. Why it's important to, you know, rehabilitate myself properly. But it doesn't have to be this life or death type thing. Understanding anatomy can be helpful in just becoming more fit. Make, again, making better lifestyle choices. I really cannot overstate the importance of anatomy. And what's cool too, is if you start down this path, it's easier to understand other sciences. It's like languages. You learn, right? You learn a second language, it's easier to learn the third. And the more you learn, it's easier to, to understand more. Obviously, sciences are very different, right? Physics is fundamentally different than biology. At the same time, the language that all these subjects speak is systems. That is what nature and reality is. Just systems and subsystems and how they interact. And when you start approaching the world through this, things make sense. You may not be able to do much about them. You, know, you can look at political systems, you can look at financial and economical systems, and you may not be able to physically do anything about it. But I, for me personally, it's removed a lot of anxiety. It's removed a lot of um, anger and frustration around things. Because I'm able to intellectually understand what's going on at some level. And I credit anatomy to being the source of that power. Thanks for hanging out with me. This is a fun episode. I'll see you in the next one.